Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to an MTG article breakdown video. Today we are reading through a classic article, Wizard's First Rule by Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa. He is a Magic the Gathering Hall of Famer. He is a two-time Pro Tour champion. He is a world champion. He has really won at every level of the game, and he's also a fantastic writer. So we're going to be going through this article from 2010. So it's an oldie but a goodie, a really classic article that will help you play better Magic the Gathering. And hopefully I'll be able to give it some more exposure and maybe explain some of the examples for a newer audience that might not understand all of them. Anyway, let's dive on in. PV's Playhouse, Wizard's First Rule. Wizard's first rule, people are stupid. <laughs> Richard and Colin frowned even more. People are stupid. Given proper motivation, almost anyone will believe almost anything. Because people are stupid, they will believe a lie because they want to believe it's true, or because they are afraid it might be true. People's heads are full of knowledge, facts, and beliefs, and most of it is false, yet they think it all true. People are stupid. They can only rarely tell the difference between a lie and the truth, and yet they are confident they can, and so are all the easier to fool. Wizard's First Rule, Chapter 36. For those of you who are not real nerds and are not aware, Wizard's First Rule is the first of tw the 12 books in the series Sword of Truth, written by Terry Goodkind. I understand that a lot of people hate the author in the series, but I rather liked it, and I devoured the 12 books pretty quickly. There was also a TV show, it got cancelled, Legend of the Seeker, but other than the characters, it didn't really bear any resemblance to the books, and I can't say I recommend it. If you haven't read the books, it's go just going to be an awful series. <laughs> And if you have, you will just be mad that they changed everything. <laughs> anyway, I digress. I love how Paulo just starts his articles in the middle of nowhere sometimes. One of the reasons I like this series so much is that I found that most of the things they say can actually be applied to real people. At points, it felt almost like I was reading a book about psychology, except there were some wizards and spells in the middle of it. I certainly learned a lot with it, and one of the things that I believe is very correct is the wizard's first rule. You saw the explanation above taken from the book. But the main point that they keep keep repeating throughout the 12 books is that people will believe anything because they want it to be true or because they are afraid it might be true. Of course, I have no pretense to write an article about human psychology because I don't know nearly enough about it and because this is not a psycho psychology website. The reason I'm even talking about this is because I think the wizard's first rule brings a very important concept that can be applied to your magic games. Remember... People will believe anything they want it to be tr they want it to be true or because they are afraid it might be true. In magic, what do people want? They want to win the game. What are they afraid of? They are afraid of losing the game. By knowing this, you can create certain scenarios that will fool them because they meet those requirements. One thing I've noticed is that people are very much like sharks. If they smell blood, they will go for it and there is no stopping them. If they feel like they are winning, then they are usually going to pursue it because winning is very good and it is what they want. As such, they will often fall into traps if you make them believe they are winning the game. One example, I have used this some example somewhere else, but it applies well for this article. My friend was playing in a tournament a while ago. He was at one life. He had a Sensei's Divining Top, which is a card that lets you look at the top three cards of your library, and a Dark Confidant in play. Dark Confidant at the beginning of your upkeep. Oh, I can show the card. At the beginning of your upkeep, you reveal the top card of your library, put that card into your hand, you lose life equal to its converted mana cost. And the Divining Top lets you look at the top three cards of your library. You can also put it on top of your library. So it's kind of a combo with Dark Confidant. You put the top, top on top of your library, so you only lose one life every turn guaranteed. His opponent was at two life and had a Tarmogoyf in play, giant creature, and a counter spell in hand, so a way to stop his threat, which my friend knew about because of a previous discard spell. On his upkeep, my friend used his Sensei's Divining Top and then used his last card to stifle the Dark Confidant trigger. So you can stifle counter target activator or triggered ability to stop the Dark Confidant from revealing the top card of the library. His opponent then realized he was going to win and counterspelled the stifle. The Bob trigger revealed a land, and my friend drew and played Threads of Disloyalty on his opponent's Goyf, attacking for the win. So just to explain this concept, basically he tricked his opponent into using his counter spell to stop a stifle that was going to do nothing and instead let him resolve his threats of disloyalty to win the game. So that's basically how that worked out. In this situation, the guy doesn't really have to counter spell the stifle. It might be argued that this is correct or not, but he is not the player to analyze. The player to talk about here is my friend. My friend knew he had the counter spell in hand and he knew that to win the game, he had to make his opponent waste it on the one card he had, the stifle, so that his threads would resolve. The way he did that was to channel Leonardo DiCaprio in Inception and insert the idea that his opponent was going to win the game by stifling the Bob, therefore suggesting that the trigger couldn't resolve or he would die, because why else would you do that since he knew the top card? Since his opponent wanted to win the game and was looking forward to that, he believed it. It was easy because he wanted to believe it. Then he lost. So, just to clarify again, 
Dark Confidant makes you lose a life when you reveal the top card of your library. They read one. So if they reveal any spell that has a mana cost greater than zero, they lose the game. They looked at the top three cards with the Sensei's Divining Top, and then they decided to try to counter their own Dark Confidant ability, therefore telling the opponent, hey, if, if this happens, I lose the game. So their opponent then said, oh, I'll win the game if I counter that. They then countered it with their counter spell. It turned out to be useless. It was all a trick because they used Wizard's First Rule. The opponent wanted to win the game and was looking forward to that, so they believed the trick. It was easy to believe it, and they lost. Debating or not whether or not it was the correct play, that's beside the point, it's kind of, but, you know, generally speaking, they could have like, potentially just won in combat or whatever, but yeah. Another example is the classic pick up the pen and go to mark the life total, which a lot of people have used many times throughout history, such as Louis and Chapin in the World's 2007 Finals. Sometimes people are undecided if they're going to attack or not. The thing is, they want to attack, but they don't know if they can. The moment you pick up your pen, you suggest to them a lie that, again, they actually want to believe, i.e. that you don't have anything. Then they attack and you play Cloud Thresher, <laughs> which is just a huge flash creature that wipes out flyers and does damage to players too. But yeah, just big flash creature or whatever. There's a very famous example of uh, that happening where, and maybe not the exact, there, there's a very famous example of the pen trick which uh, has been used in, in, in these sorts of examples before. But we'll, we'll, we can talk about the pen trick in a different thing. But the idea is you pick up the pen and they think, oh, they're not going to block. And then you do something when they do attack. Um, another good example, because they want to attack. It's just, it's kind of a funny psychological thing. I don't know how, I mean, it, it, it's, it's just kind of a psychological thing. Like against a good player, they generally shouldn't fall for that sort of thing. Um, but it's just kind of funny. Another good example, in which I will steal from LSV's Bokum report again, is there anything he didn't do? Is the mere skip a land drop example. This is a really good this is a really good one. Basically, LSV thought the guy was debating killing his mirror and then skipped a land drop on purpose as to make it more appealing for his opponent, who then obliged and killed the mana guy. Mirrors are like two mana creatures that can tap for one mana. Why did he kill the mirror? Because he wanted an easy win. Wins are just too attractive. People can't help themselves. So basically, the person tried to mana screw him because he missed a land drop, so they were like, oh, he doesn't have any more lands. But LSV did have lands, and so he then proceeded to hit his land drops. They see a player who is supposedly having mana problems, and then they just have to go for it, because if the opponent does not draw lands in the next turns, they've won the game regardless of what else they do. There are no complicated plays, no room for mistakes, no nothing. They've just won. What Luis did was to present this easy win to his opponent, who then believed it, because it was his dream scenario, and acted in a way to make that happen. This is also why the skipping land drops works for people to overextend into your wraths, so your board sweepers. The moment they spot a vulnerability, they have to go and try to exploit it. In this case, they want to kill you before you have the chance to recover, from your mana problems. And it is easy to convince them you don't actually have a land because that is what they were hoping for before the match even started. So because they hope you'll miss a land drop, when you pretend to miss a land drop, they'll believe it because they want to believe it because that'll increase their chances of winning. As the rule says, people will also believe something because they are afraid it might be true. A lot of the time, people will buy the idea that you have a certain card in hand or are going to play in a certain way because this is what they are afraid is going to happen. If you play a blue deck, for example, people will always be afraid you have a counter spell for their best card. As such, it is easy to convince them that you have it. You don't even have to work very hard. All you have to do is fuel their imagination. In the above example, the one where they are deciding whether to attack and you mark your life total, it would also be relatively easy to convince them that you do have something because this is what they fear. The moment they hesitate, sometimes all it takes is an impatient, so are you attacking, or the flick of a card in your hand, or the motion to go tap a land, and then they will instantly be convinced that you have the card they fear you have. They will then pass the turn without attacking. This doesn't really work against, like, really good players, um, because really good players will just, tr like, do the math and calculations and all this stuff, but in a lot of levels of competition, you can definitely be, like, you can... When you play against good players, you always think they have it, or it's your inclination to always think they have it. Um, I know that that's kind of like the way that my mind has sometimes gone when I've played against good players that I know are really good, like Hall of Famers or things like that. We're like, oh, they must have it because they're like really good. And so it's almost like a thing where like, uh, depending on the quality of your opponent or the skill level or the perceived skill level, the odds of them like making a weird play that indicates they have something that might be able to fool people more often. At this year's draft portion at Nationals, I was playing a blue-white deck against what I can only assume was a beginner player on black-red. The game got to a point where I knew he had a fireball for lethal, but I had a safe passage in my hand. Safe passage prevents damage this turn. The problem was that I was stuck on five lands and couldn't play spells and keep up mana to counter his fireball, so I needed him to actually play it so I could counter it and then start to play my threats. But he was simply never playing it. I was playing a blue deck, and at that point he was afraid I was going to counter his spell, so he just assumed I had a counter. 
What I did then was to unnecessarily tap both my islands to play a one and a blue spell, leaving a white 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 untapped. My opponent, who had been fearing a counterspell for the entire game, realized he had reaped the rewards of his patience. He was so happy. He really just wanted to win, and it was easy for him to believe he had won the game. He tapped all his mana and fireballed me to ten for ten, even though I was at two. I then safe passaged it. Safe passage only costs three mana. And he said something like, duh, forgot about that card. I then proceeded to untap, play my Sarah Angel, an air con servant in consecutive turns, and proceeded to win the game. Okay, actually, I didn't. He drew Ember Holler and killed me. <laughs> That's really funny. But the story gets much better the other way, don't you agree? The point is, my opponent believed I had a card because he was afraid I had it, so I had to play in a way that convinced him I was not going to use it in that turn. In the process, creating the scenario in which he saw the win and therefore didn't really think properly and just went for it. You can use this to make them fear, for example, a pump spell or a burn spell. If you don't attack with everything, then they will know you don't have the lightning bolt to finish them off. If you do attack with everything, though, even if you don't have the bolt, it will be really easy to make them think you have it. No one wants to lose the game, and they want to lose the game even less, <laughs> and they want to lose even less a game they think they are winning. So all you have to do is put them in a position that makes them lose to a card, and they will automatically be sure you have that card, because this is how people work. Even if there is no card in your deck that could win the game in a certain position, they don't know that. People have a strong imagination, and they will come up with the most absurd scenarios and firmly believe you have everything you need that if that is going to <laughs> everything you need if that is going to kill them. There's a, a very famous Magic the Gathering play that happened at the Pro Tour where uh, a player was like guaranteed to win the game if his creature lived, and his opponent attacked him. And before the opponent had a chance to uh, block, used a pump spell. And then acted as if they were confused that the player had not gone to blocks yet. Because basically what they had was a really, really powerful creature in play that uh, was like small. It was like a 1-1 one, one that like tapped to take control of opposing creatures. So it was like going to win them the game if they like got to untap. So they attacked, cast their pump spell, implying to their opponent that they had a second pump spell and put the fear of losing into them. And so the opponent chump blocked with their creature that was like guaranteed to win them the game and to try and survive because the other op alternative was them just dying to this pump spell the opponent didn't have the pump spell they had just used their first pump spell as a bluff and uh it ended up winning them the game because they used this exact premise so this is the sort of thing where it's easy to think oh this doesn't happen or this can't happen against good players but it certainly can happen against good players and it almost is more likely to happen against good players if you use it wisely because while he says like they'll come up with the most absurd scenarios sometimes they'll just be able to be aware of the common scenario and they won't be able to assess like, oh, if I make this block, I lose the game anyway, um, type vibes. So they'll just like try to play around too much. And that's like uh, a, a trough people go into where they start off being like, okay, they don't play around anything because they aren't aware anything exists. And then they go into this trough where they see shadows around every corner because they know they can play around stuff and they've got that thrill like, oh, I played around this spell. And then they come back up a little bit and they're like, okay, I'll play around stuff sometimes, but I can't play around everything. And so that's just kind of uh, a thing with this rule. Your part in the story is to make sure that there is something that can beat them, and then make sure they see it. If you don't play your sixth land, they cannot fear Darksteel Sentinel, can they? <laughs> it's a six mana, six six flash, vigilance, indestructible. Wild. Wild cards from back in the day. A lot of the times, I see people tapping two lands and passing with five mana up and three cards in hand. Whereas if you just play an eighth land, it might completely change the way they play, because now you have access to Sentinel mana. <laughs> yeah, this is six mana. Oh. Yeah, okay. If you don't play your first planes off your splash, they will never fear Sunblast Angel the following turn. Destroy all tapped creatures. If you don't play your quarter shield for no reason, they will not fear a metal crafted bleak coven vampires. I just love all these like random old cards that get referred to in this article from 2010. Uh, enters the battlefield, you can throw your more artifact to target player, loses four, and you gain four. So it's like a burn spell, essentially. But yeah, you don't play your quarter shield, you just play this for extra metal craft or whatever. Metal craft is if you have three or more artifacts in play. I don't care if you don't have those cards, if you don't have another, even have another planes in your deck. They don't know that, and for all they know, you might just be waiting for another white mana to wipe their board. The point is, they will fear things that beat them, because that is how things are. But for that, you must give them something to fear. My friend was playing a Magic Online match the other day, and he had a 6-6, six, six, tapped, some guy with an equipment, and a 2-2, two, two, untapped. Both players were at 5 life, and the opponent had a 3-3 three, three, and one card in hand. The opponent then attacked with his 3-3. Three, three. My friend instantly thought he had Galvanic Blast, which is a like burn spell that can target players, deal 4 or 2, because that was the card he feared, the card that would make him lose the game. As such, he blocked with his 2-2, two, two. then he attacked with the 6-6, six, six, and the opponent played Dispense Justice, killed his guy, and two turns later he lost. Dispense Justice kills an attacking creature. In this scenario, the attack from the other guy serves two purposes. The first one is putting the fear of Blast in my friend's mind, convincing him that the one card in his hand is Blast. 
The second is making it look like the win is within reach. Having already convinced his opponent the card is Blast, because if it wasn't, and it isn't a chump blocker, then why would he attack? He can make the opponent go for the win there. My friend wanted to believe he had a Blast now, because then he would win the game. He wanted to believe his opponent was trying to desperately sneak in the last three points of damage to finish him off, and he had called his bluff, so he attacked and lost. In here, the guy had to do something. He had to attack. If he just passes the turn, there's no way my friend is going to fear the Blast, because it doesn't kill him, so why would he? He had to make the blast a threat, and for that he had to attack. Remember, playing not to lose. When the game is good, you should play around cards because the stakes are too high. The same applies for them. If the game is good for them, the game is good means you're, you're going to win if the game continues in this situation. They have all the more reason to fear something like a burn spell that can snatch a victory from under their noses, and you should exploit that. The real beauty of it is that they are I often actually correct to play against certain cards when they are in a winning situation. So all you have to do is present the possibility of those cards happening, and a decent player will often fall for it, because they are basically put in a spot where the odds, I generally don't like to use the word odds since it looks too much like poker, which I know nothing about but I'm struggling to find a good replacement, will force them to make the losing play. We're now going to transport back to when dinosaurs walked the earth, and invasion was standard legal. Invasion is a very old set for those who have never heard of it. In case you weren't playing back then, it was a format in which control decks were actually draw-go. None of this tapping out for Kaiga, which is just a Sorcerer Speed Dragon, Baneslayer Angel, Sorcerer Speed Angel, Grave Titan, Six Mana Creature that can win the game, Cruel Ultimatum, Giant Sorcery, Broodbait Dragon, Giant Flyer. Nonsense. <laughs> Real. This sentence is so funny. <laughs> Uh, real men killed their opponents with Nether Spirit or Millstone. Nether Spirit just like comes back into play if you don't have any more creatures. Um, if it's the only creature in your graveyard, and Millstone is like a way to like mill opponents out two cards at a time. <laughs> I remember I even had a blue white deck running both, and I'd often Millstone myself. He was a blue white deck playing Nether Spirit. <laughs> Millstone myself until I found another spirit and then mill them for utter dominance. In this format, things worked like that because instants were simply too strong. You had very powerful counters. Absorb, which is three mana counter, gain three life. Undermine, which is three mana counter, they lose three life. Counterspell, two mana counter. And a very powerful card drawing, Factor Fiction. Four mana, reveal the top five. They separate it into two piles. And you put one pile in your hand and the other into your graveyard. So it's like a draw three at the very least, pretty much. For those who haven't played with it, it was... <laughs> It was that format's Jace the Mind Sculptor, which was a Planeswalker that used to be really, really good, especially in 2010. But uh, it got banned in Modern at one point and all that stuff. But now it's like not played very much at all. As a result of that, of that, it was not uncommon to see decks with 25 lands, two creatures, and the rest all instants. You basically never wanted to tap out in your turn or had any reason to do so. Then there was this card, Blood Oath. Go on, you can read it. <laughs> It's, it's actually really funny. There's a video on the Card Market YouTube channel where they play Old Standard, and Frank Karsten, who actually played back then, plays a deck that has Blood Oath in it against Torolf Toffel Severin. And it's actually one of my, it's like a really, really good video. You should definitely check it out. But uh, he uses Blood Oath in that video, and it's awesome. So definitely check that sort of thing out if you're interested in magic during this era. But yeah. Um, choose a card type. Target opponent reveals his or her hand, then deal three damage to that player for each card of the chosen type revealed this way. So you can name artifacts, creatures, enchantments, instants, lands, and sorceries. This was before Planeswalkers were a thing. I really liked this card because the mere reason that it existed meant I changed the way I played, even if I didn't run it. And I remember, some decks ran 30 plus instants without, with a lot of card drawing. Imagine the scenario. You are playing Fires, which is a red-green deck with lots of elves. This is the exact deck that Frank Karsten plays in that video. And big guys. Your opponent is playing the Nether Go deck, which is pretty much exactly... His opponent was playing a, uh, a control deck, so I think maybe, maybe that deck. Um, yeah. You get to a situation where it is game two, important, and you are all out of resources. Your opponent has dealt with everything you have, and you have one card left in your hand, a land. You know your opponent's hand is two factor fictions and a counter spell from previous factor fictions. Now you have to say you are pretty likely to lose that game. You have nothing, and he has everything. To make matters worse, he is at 18 life. Then at the end of the turn, he taps his remaining four mana and plays one of his two factor fictions, revealing counter spell, counter spell, undermine, undermine, nether spirit. So fork, instance, and another spirit. Here you have a lot of combinations that will let your opponent with two extra counters and another spirit in their graveyard, and you have what is generally going to be the best play. Warning, it doesn't work against idiots. You can split Nether Spirit versus the four instants. This actually comes up in the video with Frank Karsten. I'm going to link it in the description of this video because it's such a good video and it's such a sweet moment where he, Frank Karsten literally has the choice of whether to give his opponent like all, all the spells in one pile or not. To understand why you do that, you have to go through the game to see through your opponent's eyes. 
one of those Christmas tales where we can see the story from everyone's perspective. Imagine you were the opponent, you have factor fiction and a counter spell left in your hand at 18 life against a deck that has like 20 cards that matter and 40 blanks when your deck is designed to win the late game. You have to be feeling pretty good against your chances. Even better, you are resolving another factor fiction and you don't see how you can possibly lose. With another spirit to block now and two extra counter spells, then your opponent splits it this way. What comes instantly to your mind? Blood Oath does, and then the realization that you should have just waited a turn to play your factor fiction. But then it's too late now. You suddenly get scared because you are afraid of losing this game. Losing it is an abomination, a disgrace, something to be avoided at all costs. All the more because this game is so good for you. I will not bother you with the calculation details, but I did the math and the chance of winning the game when you pick the Nether Spirit is around 90%. The chance of winning the game when you pick the 4 card pile is 99.5% if you assume he doesn't have the Blood Oath, which kills you on the spot. But what are the odds he has a Blood Oath? Oath, 10, 20%, 30%, is he even playing it? Why did he split the cards that way? Maybe because he wants to trick me. But then again, maybe he really has it. How smart is he? How smart does he think I am? Maybe he th thinks that all... <laughs> I'll think that he thinks it's too complicated. Is it worth risking it to win a game that you are very likely winning anyway? Most of the time, no, it isn't. If I was in this exact situ scenario, I would probably pick the Nether Spirit pile unless I could get a read on my opponent, which I wouldn't be able to because I'm very bad at that. <laughs> again, that's playing not to lose when you are winning. <laughs> it's, it's, it's honestly crazy that he wrote this in 2010 and they recorded that video like last year or something and this exact scenario came up and it's just so awesome that footage of this exact type of thing exists and it's just perfect for this sort of article that i i, I really will I'll, I'll link the video so you can learn from it too it's, it's so awesome now let's get back to being ourselves in this situation you know you are 10 percent to win if he picks the four card pile you are 0.5 percent to win however if you split it three two and he picks two counters you're now one percent to win certainly not much of an improvement in you are your eyes you're risking half a percent to gain nine percent which is certainly something you want to do you're probably still losing, but now at least you have a real chance. Let's face it, you weren't winning the game if you split to 3-2 anyway, so even if he has the read on you, you don't lose much. So in the situation you split 1-4, both players do what's mathematically correct, it ends up benefiting you. Your opponents can't even be blamed because you took the correct path. You suddenly gain an extra 9% simply because you presented to your opponent the scenario to where he was going to lose the game, and losing the game is unbearable. And just for the record, I have killed someone with a Blood Oath for 21 after a 5-0 Factor Fiction split. <laughs> nice little flex. So basically, there are two main things that will make your opponent play differently than he ordinarily would. The prospect of a win and the fear of defeat. It is your job as their opponent to make sure you present them with a scenario that is more convenient to you. If you want them to play around a card, make sure you make that card a threat. If you want them to fear Bolt, play in a way that Bolt will kill them if they don't do it. If, on the other hand, you want them not to play around a card, make it look like things are going the way they want to. They don't want you to have anything. They want you to die. And they don't want you <laughs> That's just a funny statement to read. Uh... It, uh, and with no context and you don't have to do much to convince them that this is what is happening because they are predisposed to believe it by exploiting those two feelings you can sometimes guide your opponents to the path you want them to go and win games that you otherwise wouldn't this is it for today i hope you've enjoyed it and see you next week <laughs> pv which is paulo vitor so pretty much the premise is uh this one make your opponent play differently by giving them the prospect of a win and the fear of defeat if you did make it all the way to the end of this video uh, I do hope you enjoyed it. Hit the thumbs up button, subscribe for more, and comment with your questions, thoughts, and feedback. And to let me know you made it all the way to the end of the video, leave hashtag first rule in the comments section down below because this article was, as we already know, called Wizard's First Rule. I had to find this one using the Wayback Machine, so it's a classic article. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it for this one. I will, um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll talk to you next time.